Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I would like to make a very brief introduction and tell you a little bit about the beginning uh, of the book's journey. Uh, and more precisely, how the idea of the book was first put into words. It was nearly the end of uh, 2018. Uh, Zeynep Çelik gave a talk at Anamed, uh, it's Koç University Re Research Center for Anatolian Civilizations. And uh, it was uh, the 14th anniversary of the publication of Edward Said's Orientalism and also uh, Çelik's article on Said's influence on the architectural history was about to be published then. Uh, after the talk, uh, Anamet's manager, Buket Joshkuner, brought us together uh, and we discussed about uh, the, this book, the idea of the book and uh, how this study uh, of uh, Ms. Celix uh, can be developed and uh, become a book. And uh, Professor Celik explained to me that she would like to expand the content by referring to the topics which she couldn't mention in, in her article. And she, would, uh, she said she would like to add pictures, photographs, maybe even uh, scenes uh, from movies. And uh, she had uh, the book uh, already figured out in her mind. And Professor Celik also uh, thought of adding a reader at the end of the book following her uh, introduction. And uh, there include excerpts from late 19th and early 20th century Ottoman and Turkish intellectuals. And those uh, excerpts will uh, reflect their responses to the representations of the Orient. Uh, after talking about uh, this project, uh, I brought it uh, to our editorial board and uh, informed them all the way uh, of the process and uh, they gave uh, their full support uh, right from the beginning. Uh, I myself also thought uh, that uh, that was an extraordinary, exciting idea uh, because uh, uh, with this way, uh, we could uh, illustrate that long before Said, there were counter voices who criticized the representations of the Orient by Europeans. Although some of those intellectuals wrote their pieces in French uh, or in English, uh, back then uh, they were heard uh, only locally. And now uh, with this book, uh, we listened to them from their own voices over more than a century. Uh, we listened to the responses of Orientalism from the Orient itself, as uh, Rashid Khalidi uh, put it. And uh, this uh, helps to recontextualize uh, Orientalism. And uh, what is more important is that uh, with this book, uh, which we published in uh, Turkish and in English, we will hopefully have the opportunity to make uh, the voices of those uh, intellectuals heard all over the world. And, uh, but however, uh, selecting uh, pieces uh, from a variety of authors and preparing them for publication and carrying out uh, the preparations of the Turkish and English editions simultaneously uh, made this process uh, a very real uh, challenge. And of course, uh, it required a great team uh, like uh, we had. And this team uh, has overcome this challenge very skillfully within a miraculous period of time, we can say. Uh, the Turkish edition uh, was published uh, in a year. An English edition uh, followed uh, after four months uh, of uh, the Turkish edition. So uh, here, uh, I would like to congratulate uh, them all, thank everyone who contributed to the book and uh, hand the floor over to uh, Zeynep Hanım. Thank you. Um, thank you. On February the 18th, we held a webinar at uh, Anamet in Turkish on the why question regarding Europe knows nothing about the Orient. We discussed why we thought the book mattered. There will be another why panel on April the 2nd in English, during which I will engage in a conversation with Professor Rashid Halidi. 
Today, we will focus on the how question, that is on the making of the book, a truly complicated affair. My immense gratitude goes to Koch University Press for agreeing to go on this rocky trip with me. The amount of labor involved in Europe knows nothing about the Orient is overwhelming. There's always a lot of teamwork in every work, but I believe we hit a record with this one. Due to the heterogeneous nature of the original text that formed the second part of the book titled A Reader. Today, we will not talk much about my introductory essay. Instead, we will concentrate on a reader, which could not have been produced without a large, competent, and dedicated team. Every member of the team worked relentlessly and conscientiously. I thank them all from the bottom of my heart, and I regret not being able to include the entire group in this meeting. We will refer to their work throughout our conversation. In order to introduce today's topic, I tried to sketch the production process and came up with a diagram. As incomplete as it is, I believe the sketch reflects the overall complexity of our process, with arrows going in all directions. I started out on the left with the original text in Ottoman Turkish and uh, early Republican Turkish, as well as French text and English text. I ended up with the production going to the printer for the Turkish edition here and the English edition there. Nevertheless, the beginning and the end points are misleading. In effect, the beginning goes back 40 years to the publication of Edward Said's Orientalism and how that book and the following debates affected my thinking during these four decades. The end is ambiguous because I offer the book as an open-ended project, an archive that will hopefully be filled in. The back and forth travels of the arrows underline the fact that this was not a linear process, but a rather circuitous one. The sort of abstract art we have on the screen is not only a summary of our collaborative work, but also shows how the roles became blurry at many points, resulting in many of us participating in discussions and decision-making processes that we had not signed up for. I cannot go over the entire diagram here, but let me point to a couple of anomalies. Uh, and I will be talking about two blurbs that fall outside the main body. Uh, these are when we needed help from the outside, from outside the team. For example, Hatu Uzmane, expert on calligraphy, refers to our strug struggle with dökümler, donanmalar, kilitler terms that Ismail Hakkı used in reference to calligraphy. After consulting with an expert, and thank you again, Sibad Borders, Aron translated them as stylistic elongations and lockets and swirls. Speaking for myself, I enjoyed every phase of the work, thanks to the harmony between us. Our five, six hour Zoom meetings, such as this one here, may have been draining, but they were also spiced with great jokes and much laughter. I am already missing them. Our challenges were many. Let me give a few examples. Translating Tafik Fikret's article on Pierre Lotti's Aziade, Gregory Key noticed something was wrong with the phrase transliterated as Issiz güzellerin 
Mufliki Baghdad Telakisi, which would translate as the scaffold where the idol beauties met death. We had to check Loti's original text as well as Tefik Fikas paraphrasing of Loti. The latter proved to be rather difficult as the print was blurred. We came as close as Birdari, a place, not Berdar, which means scaffolding, but could not go any further. At this point, I called Tun Shen, whose Ottoman reading skills surpassed ours, and after struggling it with a while, he resolved the issue. The correct reading was Mühliki Birdar Telakisi. Ki then translated the phrase as the meeting place for all the lovely harem wives who were at a loose end. So what may seem like a trifle episode occupied us for many, many hours. Another challenge was reading the European names in Arabic script, an infamous struggle. If we knew the references, we could figure them out. We could read Voltaire, Viole Ludic, easily. But if they were obscure, we got into trouble. Describing his visit to the 1889 Paris International Exhibition Grounds, Ahmed Mitat talked about what our translator read as a cotton house, a cotton pool. I must admit, we slept through this during our copy editing phase of the Turkish version. But cotton pool or cotton fountain did not make any sense when we hit the translation and we had to consult the original text. There was no other way of reading that word. It was cotton, cotton. I went back to the drawing board and after considerable research on the international exhibition, figured out that Ahmed Mitat was referring to an artist, Jules Félix Couton, who had created the sculptures adorning the pool. Ahmed Mitat had called the structure in shorthand as the Couton Pool. It was again Ahmed Mitat who cornered us with his casual reference to his good friend Sheikh Fetullah, a scholar very knowledgeable on women's rights in Islam. Who was this man? Nobody knew. After coming through quite a bit of secondary literature on Islamic law and women in English, I finally figured out he was Hamza Fatallah, an Egyptian intellectual who had written a book in Arabic on the rights of women in 1889. Oh, we were provoked on so many terrains. An article published in Resimlai was a scathing attack on films which glorified French colonialism in North Africa, focusing on one film. Which film was that? Its title was given as Kahraman Sipahi, The Brave Cavalry Man. And this was all we had to work with in addition to the date of the article 1929. I browsed through many books and articles on French colonial cinema and found nothing. We were hence not able to give any explanation in the Turkish edition. I am a persistent researcher and my incompetence haunted me. So I started my search again during the translation phase, now paying attention to the stills from the cinema of the 1920s and comparing them with the photographs in Resim Lai. Suddenly there he was, Gary Cooper. His familiar face was staring at me in a photograph, a duplicate of the one printed in Resim Lai. The film was not French, but American even though it was about French colonial forces in North Africa and had a French title, Le Beau Sabre. I was so blinded by the textual material and the assumptions I had made on the context that I had forgotten to take the visual stuff seriously. I will stop here. I hope I did not drown you in detail. My goal was simply to cast light on some aspects of the concealed amount of labor that goes into an adventure such as this one. My, my colleagues will have other stories for you. And the 
stage is yours, Sibel. Unmute yourself, Sibel. Ah, sorry, sorry, thank you. Thank you, Professor Chilik. In the production of Europe Knows Nothing About the Orient, my main responsibility was coordinating the workings of many fronts that constitute a translated book's publication process. In a standard translated book, these fronts consist of the author, translator, editor, proofreader, indexer, and graphic designers, all of whom more or less work on a text in this order. With Europe Knows Nothing About the Orient, as we worked on the Turkish and English edition simultaneously, and due to the multi-authored and multilingual nature of the project, we had two translators, several translators added to the mix, all of which made for a very tight and complicated publishing schedule. Publishing two editions just a few months apart from each other meant that almost all fronts were simultaneously at work for both editions at all times. Professor Chirik and I started working on Europe Knows Nothing About the Orient in the scorching summer of 2019 in Koch University Research Center for Anatolian Civilizations in Beyoğlu. After three weeks of hard work that went into finalizing the list of the text that will be in the volume, it was clear that we were going to need three sets of translators. One set for the translation of Ottoman texts, one for the translation of French and English texts for the Turkish edition, and finally, one set for the translation of all of them into English for the English edition. For us to publish two editions relatively close to one another, once the translation of the Ottoman texts were complete, their translations into English were to begin. While it was a challenge to find such talented translators with excellent command of Turkish and English and with a strong knowledge in Turkish literature, the biggest challenge for me personally was managing the schedules of all these sets of translators, eight people in total, whose deadlines were really close and whose work were strongly interconnected with one another, along with keeping the publishing schedule set by the Koch University Press, which involved the copy editing, proofreading, indexing and designing stages. Excel has become my best friend in the last year and a half. I made multiple Excel tables for everybody's workload and deadlines and corresponded with a brilliant team of translators, editors, proofreaders and indexers on a regular basis. I feel that to further explain my involvement and coordination in the publication of the two titles, I should go over the publishing stages of both editions of Europe Knows Nothing About the Orient in a bit of detail. After finding our translators with the necessary skill sets and contacting them about the details and deadlines of the project, the first step on my coordination to-do list, as I mentioned before, was the translation of the Ottoman text and translation of French and English text into Turkish. Esra Darya Gönan and Fatma Damak took over the difficult task of, task of translation, as well as updating the Ottoman text to language. Ayşen Gür translated French and English texts into Turkish. As soon as they sent their finished work over to me, I shared them with our translators Gregory Key, Nagis Parchinel, Michael Hughes and Ilker Hepkanaj and started working on the copy editing myself for the Turkish edition. While the copy editing stage for the Turkish edition was underway, Professor Çelik and I went over the visual materials she chose for the book. Passing them on to our graphic designers Emir Çıkınoğlu and Gökçen Ergüven, and informing them of our choices of placement and style in accordance with the text was also my responsibility. Çıkınoğlu and Ergüven designed both editions brilliantly, took extra time and care whilst working on the old photos and documents, some of which were not in the best quality. They took our ideas on board and came up with wonderful suggestions that further defined the book's aesthetic. In the English edition, they came up with the numbered design for the terms on figure nine, after Professor Çelik and Aronoji suggested that this particular visual deserved a more structured look and a more in-depth analysis. Mihal Bostekin joined our team as proofreader in the last stage of the Turkish edition, though her contribution went well beyond proofreading. Mihal was instrumental in keeping the linguistic flow of the entire volume, as well as refining the Ottoman text. She was also the indexer of the edition. Rana Alpöz, Mihal Bostekin, Ayşen Gür, Professor Çelik and I worked on the text diligently in the last stages of the production over multiple Zoom meetings last summer when we were all stuck in our homes because of COVID-19. We were all once again in awe of the late Ottoman and early Republic authors' intellectual brilliance in this process. They were already well read in their fields and their expertise were evident in their references to their contemporaries and contemporary styles and movements 
which they spelled in their writings in Ottoman pronunciation. We took great care of preserving these spellings in copy editing and proofreading stages. The term Anluminur, a European manuscript illumination style mentioned in Jalilesat article, Arab decorative style, was a moment of triumph for us, once we managed to track it to its original spelling from the Ottoman pronunciation, thanks to Ayşe Angür's contributions. As we were nearing the final stages of the Turkish edition's publication, majority of English translations were complete and ready for the production of the English edition. I shared both the English translations and the original text, first with Gregory Key, who copied it the majority of them, and then with Aranaji, who edited all of the translations and took the utmost care in preserving the author's individual voices. Just under a month after the Turkish edition's publication, Professor Çelik, Aranaji and I started doing the final readings of the English edition. During this process, Professor Çelik and Aranaji suggested we add the author's biographies and historical periodical sections to the book for the international readers who want to know more about these late Ottoman and early Republic authors and the periodicals the majority of their text in the volume appeared in. I did the biographical and archival research necessary for these sections, as well as combing through the visuals to go in line with Professor Çelik. Here, I'd like to show you a few pages from these sections as the English edition has just been resealed, released. Here you go. Uh, these two pages are from the historical periodical sections. As you can see, they include the front pages of two periodicals as well as short texts about their history and significance. And these two are from the author's biography section. They include the photos of the authors and their short biographies. I'd like to conclude my talk here by once again underlining that both editions of Europe Knows Nothing About the Orient were truly a team effort. Although it was a challenging project from a coordinational viewpoint, it was a joy to work with such professional individuals and it was very rewarding to see all the team players' hard work and excellent contributions come together and complement each other. Now I'd like to hand the floor over to Ayşen Gür. Now you're here. Uh, I'm one of the very various uh, translators in this book. In the first phase of the project, I translated the text written in English and French into Turkish. And I, when I was working, I often remember this famous phrase, the medium is the message. The medium in this instance is the choice of language. The fact that some Ottoman writers in this collection wrote their essays in French or English suggests that those intellectuals did not want to simply write about how they were per perceived by the Occident. They wished to appeal to them directly. It's some hundred years after them, the decision to publish this collection bilingually is a similar choice to communicate with the entire world. Zeynep Çelik wrote the introduction in English, as it's the lingua franca of our times. However, she was also very invested in the Turkish version. And we worked together by phone or by Zoom using a technique called Le Gouloir. Gustave Flaubert, the French novelist, is famous for his pursuit of stylistic perfection. And this involved the attempt to eliminate from his prose all sorts of uh, consonances, assonances, and repetition by reading his sentences out loud. And this test he called the gueuloir from gueule in French, which means to yell. And so with Zene, uh, we read my translation loudly, making multiple changes along the way. Gueule is a highly effective method. I recommend it to every writer and translator. Now I want to talk about the original text in the collection. Almost all were, were written in Turkish, except five. A little literary review, two parodies about Loti, one poem in French and one passage in English. As I mentioned before, the choice of language in this text is meaningful. For these writers, the intended audience was the Occident. 
We know that in other parts of the world, especially in colonies like India or North Africa, the intellectuals used to write extensively in French or English because they wanted to appeal from the periphery to the metropole. In the Ottoman Empire and Turkey, things of course were different, but the willingness to enter into dialogue with the West was the same. Three of these texts I translated from French to Turkish were about Pierre Lutti's novel, Les Désenchantés, published in 1906. At the time, Lutti was famous and admired in Turkish literary circles. And it, that was his third book about Turkey. I presume that the writers of this criticism of Les Désenchantés were hoping to reach Lutti himself. Uh, the parodies or pastiches, uh, if you want, uh, of Izzet Melih are particularly interesting because on one hand, Izzet Melih was among the pro-French writers of his times. He lived in Paris, he wrote articles and even a play in French. And in 1918, one of his novels would be translated into that language with a foreword by Pierre Lotti himself. On the other hand, these two parodies imitating Pierre Lotti and Genan, one of his fictive characters, characters were written uh, just several weeks after the so-called 1908 revolution, the, the beginning of the uh, second constitutional era in the Ottoman Empire, where the Ottoman intellectuals had high hopes for radical changes, progress, modernization. In this context, Pierre Lutti's nostalgia for a dilapidated, incurious, laggard, slow-paced Orient was very exasperating. These parodies reveal the mutual misunderstanding, the gap between Izet Melih and Pierre Lutti. For Izet Melih, Turkey is a reality. For Pierre Lutti, a fantasy. There was also an anonymous satirical poem in French, Le Touriste. This poet, of course, is not a Baudelaire or Malarme. After all, the poem is merely meant to be a satire, but it is still very painstakingly written, uh, composed in octosyllabic quatrains, each line consisting of eight syllables, which shows intimate knowledge uh, of the conventions of French poetry. This exemplifies how well the authors in this anthology know Western culture, even as they criticize it. Now I have to <laughs> confess something. I am not as patient or as skillful as this poet. I translated this poem in pre-verse without any strict matter or any rhyme scheme because the original poem has a rhyme scheme also. A, B, A, V, la rime alterne. We call it uh, alternate rhyme or alternating rhyme in English, I think. Finally, I translated an extract from Turkey Faces West of Hali Dede, published in 1930. In this short passage, she makes some remarks concerning stereotypes about the Turks and criticizes harem fantasies. Hali Dede was very well known female novelist. In the last years of the Ottoman Empire, uh, she was always at the forefront of political activism. And as an English speaking Muslim woman, she was bound to attract uh, to attention in Britain, India, or United States. She was treated as a rarity, as a female symbol for the Westernization. In some sense, she was objectified just like the Haram women. Before finishing, I would like to say the pieces I translated for this book written some hundred years ago, still seem relevant to me. Uh, the details may differ, but the general sentiments remain. Now I will pass the floor to Aron Aji to listen his adventures during the edition of English version. <laughs> thank you so much. First, I should thank all of you, um, as of course, in particular, Professor Celik, who somehow found me <laughs> uh, on uh, via an email that showed up on my screen one day. And, um, and this has been really a privilege to work uh, uh, to work in. 
the project has been really a privilege. You know, I'm a literary translator. I translate uh, texts by single authors and, uh, and complete texts usually. And here the challenge we had was that we were working with um, uh, excerpts and um, in and and also uh, with an outstanding team of translators who combined had in fact the three very important areas of expertise we needed, namely content expertise, language expertise, and translation expertise. The more important, uh, more importantly, though, we had to work with the translations in order to create the final versions that would show all three of these levels of expertise. And certainly, I did not possess these three levels of expertise myself. And I think uh, Professor Celik, as well as uh, Sibel Doru, have uh, already uh, described the complex network of consultations that we also incorporated into the process so that the texts not only read well, but also they were as accurate as possible and enjoyable also aesthetically, as I will try to talk a little bit about that. One of the other things that really excited me, and uh, I kept Professor Celik many, many hours on the Zoom, although not the six hour, that one, that one really was entirely on the manuscript. <laughs> uh, but we have had several conversations where I was so excited about this project because this book is intended both as a literary chronicle of a particular discourse during a particular historical period and as a resource for future scholarship and future readers of contra-Orientalist discourses elsewhere in the so-called Orient. The quality of the translations as well as the content therefore mattered all the more since we hope they would encourage future scholarship, future volumes like this. And, um, and so yeah, that to me was um, an additional, almost an ethical responsibility that we had to do this right so that we could engender, in fact, uh, uh, maybe uh, 40 years after uh, Said's Orientalism, a truly quote unquote Orientalist uh, approach to this great polemic that has shaped our entire intellectual history since Said's uh, uh, book. So to bring these contra-Orientalist voices uh, across in their authenticity was really very important. Um, let me say a little bit about what my objectives were as a translation editor. In fact, I don't know too many books uh, where a credit line is given to a particular individual as a translation editor. Um, usually, all translated works, most translated works are edited by a perfectly capable editor in the target language. And the aim of the editor is to ensure clarity and readability in the target language. What I wanted to do here as a translation editor was to also bring in accuracy, authentic recreation, and attention to the rhetoric, not only what the text said, but also how it said what it said and to what effect, both in the source and the target language. 
there is a translation editor who could in fact go between the line, uh, languages as well as between the rhetoric registers of these texts so that uh, we created auth authentic representations of these texts, as authentic as was possible. I should also add that the translations that I received were by no means deficient. Um, they were actually quite good translations. And what I tried to do was to bring those additional dimensions of authenticity into the final product. Um, let me also tell you a little bit more about the, the reason why a translator, translation editor in the final analysis was a useful thing uh, to have for this project in particular. The project includes texts by 18 different authors, a total of 31 pieces in more than eight different genres from essay, journalistic writing, poetry, art history scholarship, literary fiction, diary, polemic, literary criticism, and so on. And the texts were written in a changing language environment in that particular historical period when the language moved from Ottoman Turkish to modern Turkish. In short, the question of how to reflect the distinct voice, point of view, and style of the writers became all the more crucial because of the diversity of voices, the diversity of texts, and the ever-changing language environment of Turkish. Um, as a literary translator, and I also am an educator, I, tra I, 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 I train, uh, uh, I direct the program at the University of Iowa, the MFA in Literary Translation. Uh, I work with students, especially in areas of voice and style as means of individuation. An author, uh, leaves his or her signature in their text through a voice and a style that are distinctive. And that distinctiveness is not simply a matter of aesthetic, but carries also political, ethical, ideological, social, religious, you name it, considerations that might have gone into the original creation of the texts. So to bring these, uh, the voice and the style of these write, uh, writings across as authentically and as distinctively as possible was our aim. Um, the, what I would like to, uh, and I'm not going to talk about the intrinsic differences between Turkish and English grammar and conventional form. If there are questions about those, we can talk about that, but they are fairly well covered. So what I would like to do is I'd like to sort of give you some examples and then to give you a sense of the, the, the variety we, were, we, we think we were able to create. I will also read some excerpts from the translations. And so let me try to share my screen. Uh, this is, this is um, a, a figure nine that has already been mentioned twice. And in fact, it was one piece that we probably returned to most, the most out of all the texts. I think we have a, a, a mile long email thread accumulated around this. The goal here was on the one hand to 
recognize the groundbreaking, the momentous event that Jalal Esad's sketching of a traditional Turkish home was. So we wanted not only to show what he had done, but also to translate it in a way that um, his groundbreaking work could be reflected. So in the end, what was decided was that this sketch would be translated while the original terms would be kept, as you can see in the uh, in the in the um, list below the diagram, we have both the English as well as the Turkish words for each of these uh, originally Ottoman scripted terms. But also, uh, Professor Celik wrote this beautiful mini essay about the importance, the social and cultural importance of this uh, diagram. Uh, so just to get this diagram across, we sort of created three levels of intertextuality, if you will. We had the language, the terminology, the visual, but also a little bit of a, an art historical critique, criticism, so that you, you, we hope that you would all enjoy um, and, and recognize really, not only enjoy, but recognize uh, the, the important moment that this sketch marked in um, art history in Turkey. Um, next example I want to share with you concerns a language. So here I share a Turkish sentence next to, well, uh, above, and then below is the English translation. The color coding indicate the units of thought, units of meaning that have to be absolutely captured in the original, but also to illustrate how complex Turkish syntax can be. And um, the two red spots, Chunku and Isede, are actually turning points, so to speak, in the sentence. One is, of course, beginning the sentence and, and guiding the reader into the sentence. But this little Isede is, is, is a very mean little a uh, 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 rhetorical uh, twist that happens in many Turkish sentences because it completely reverses the meaning of the sentence. It makes it a sentence that begins with, even though when we had been reading it all along as a straightforward declarative sentence. Now, of course, this is um, most clearly indicated by breaking this into two sentences. And it could have been Arab art across the regions it spread did exert an influence on the arts of the tribes that revered and respected Islam, and to a certain extent altered their distincting forms to make those forms resemble uh, itself, period, or semicolon. Yet it never directly give, gave rise to any local or regional art forms. This is a perfectly legitimate uh, uh, translation. But we wanted to give you also the, 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 the flavor of these complex syntax structures in Turkey. So we try to uh, you know, present it uh, as one sentence rather than two and at the same time, keep the reversal trope in the structure. This one is a, an especially interesting moment in uh, Jalal Esad's text. And um, here, 
he is uncharacteristically um, ornate and, uh, and exaggerated in his tone. This is a moment where he is bemoaning the fact that the Ottoman um, archives are not adequate to conduct in, in the, the real sense, art historical research and an art historical discourse. And in this moment, he's actually acknowledging the efforts of a museum director, as well as the patronage of the Sultan in this effort, but also wants to critique that the effort is not enough and that it has to continue. And in order to do that, he's actually showering both the Sultan as well as the museum director with enormous compliments. So we wanted to again show that in English so that, uh, uh, and as a result, we really uh, made sure the English read at a very high and exaggerated register, just as it is in the original old Turkish or Ottoman Turkish. So we came with this sentence. Serving in the beneficent shadow of the rightly blessed and great Sultan, Hamdi Bey, the honorable director of Musee Humayun, has, with expert effort and selfless diligence, diligence, opened a section on Ottoman art and exhibited a considerable number of valuable artworks. However, the current collection is not yet large enough to support such a history. So again, the aim was to somehow uh, achieve authentic representation or recreation. Now this one is also a very important moment and it is from Ahmed Hashim's uh, The Hospice of Storks. It's a beautiful story that um, uh, in fact closes the collection, but it is also a very important story in terms of um, uh, pointing out the modernism and how aware Ahmed Hashim was of contemporary literary practices that were especially influenced by the emergence of two art forms, namely photography and cinema. So we tried to create this passage in English uh, in a way that it would, ref it would work as if Ahmed Hashim was carrying a camera next to his eyes. And the passage was um, unfolding for the reader exactly in the sequence that Ahmed Hashim had experienced this scene. So the passage reads, after exchanging a few more thoughts on the matter, we left the Vefik Pasha room, night had fallen, Outside, now this is where you should just sort of imagine this camera. This is really very, very beautifully done. Very masterful, modernist, objectivist uh, uh, style. Outside, on a covered terrace overlooking the garden, a large vintage tray rested on a low stool waiting for us. Arranged in a circle on the tray were wooden spoons. Notice first, he is noticing the circular arrangement and then noticing that they are wooden spoons. So the order is really very 
important here. And on the floor surrounding the tray were a few small cushions. Then this is really very beautiful. Engraved on a marble plaque, almost buried among the leaves was the date of the evening that Pierre Loti had joined the iftar. Breaking fast with the Imams of the Green Mosque at this exact table. You can almost see how he notices a little part of this marble plaque buried under the leaves. And upon looking more closely, he can see the, the date and the occasion that the plaque commemorates. Madame Bey had tea prepared for us under a pergola surrounded in all sides with rose bushes near Gurabehani Laklahan. Reclined on all thatched chairs, we remained silent, sipping the delicious Chinese tea, yielding to the evening hues deepening around us and the blue-green sky in a corner of which a delicate crescent moon had taken shape. So I hope the, these examples sort of give you um, a taste of uh, the kind of variety that we have tried to preserve. I'd like to also read uh, a couple more passages, again, to, uh, to show you the differentiation in voice that we try to achieve. No doubt, such an example, such an effort would be amiss if we didn't uh, look at Namuk Kemal, whose uh, text by the title, Europe Knows Nothing About the Orient, also uh, gives the, uh, the title of the volume as well, lends its title to the volume that Professor Celik put together. Now, Namu Kemal is a fiery speaker, but also a very elegant uh, literary master. Um, it's not anger that you hear, but more passion, as well as a biting sarcasm, very sharp, very keen sarcasm. So here is a little excerpt from the very beginning uh, of this text, Europe knows nothing about the Orient. It is indeed strange that so many eminent nations intent on finding out whether or not there are people in their midst with strong desire to investigate the truth are advanced enough to keep thousands of scholars busy with various hypotheses and deductions, but they do not see the true character of a land uh, such as ours, which is so close to them that as the saying goes, it might as well be touching their eyelashes. But our citizens, should not get the wrong impression. It is strangers, it is stranger still when those people strive to uncover the depths of their conscience through the power of the epics of their ancestors lying peacefully in their graves and yet remain unaware of the character of a nation that lies with them like conjoined twins on the lap of the same earth. We have yet to see any books on the Orient written in European languages that are worthy of study. Those who truly wish to learn the character of the Orient, by what means might they achieve their goal and abandon these misconceptions? For instance, in French, the most scholarly study on our political organization, Events and National Morals, is a book by Juan Dosson. And the most factual of the studies treating our past and our custom is, as you know, Hammer's history. Whichever one of these one happens to read, one is astonished by the abundance as well as the strangeness of the ignorant fables within. This 
this passage that I'm going to read is especially important because Namak Kemal here is doing a is, is using this listing technique for full effect. It's almost like a cascading effect. At the very beginning of his history, Hammer has Sultan, Sultan Osman execute his uncle while batteries and cannons are sent from here to Kosovo. He turns progressives such as Selim I and the Köprülü into vexing souls, remembering them with denunciations befitting monks. He transforms decadents such as Bayezid II, an arrogant man such as Ibrahim Pasha, into angels of good works, describing them with the kind of exaggeration the Persians are known for. In his description, Fatih is crueler than Genghis Khan. To savages like Alexander and Hunyadi Hyanos, he ascribes a mildness and mercy approaching that of the apostles. According to his telling, wherever we go, we go in multitudes of hundreds and thousands, while our enemies merely number in 10 to 15,000. In fact, he counts a mere 5,000 soldiers standing against Fatih's entire army. He preposterously, preposterously attempts to explain away Charles V's flight from Venice to Spain upon hearing of the Ottoman offense, and worse yet, his failure to join the battle against Suleiman the Magnificent by claiming that the king didn't deign to the encounter. Whenever we are victorious, he suddenly finds an, ex, an accident to explain it. Whenever we are defeated, he extols our enemies extraordinary heroism. Any decision concerning Christians, whether based on the Sharia or issued by the Council of State, he attributes to zealotry. Every conflict is a sectarian uprise. So you can see uh, what we were trying to do was for these texts to actually um, uh, help you hear them, hear the authors and the voices. Because again, um, uh, the goal here was to um, not only present content, but also the, 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 the very distinct uh, and also the very variety of intellectuals that spoke out against the Orientalism from Europe. I don't know if I have time for another piece, or maybe we can just uh, go to the questions. Anybody who would like, uh, shall we just uh, go to the question and answer? And maybe we can um, address, if there is any interest, we can address the other pieces later on. Okay, George, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Marivis Bahani for, from Columbia Global Centers, Istanbul. Now it's time for a discussion and we'll be receiving questions from our audience. So we would like to remind you that, you know, you can post your questions on the Q&A function and we will uh, read them uh, to our panelists. Uh, maybe just to start off the discussion, uh, I would like to ask one question if I may about the process through which uh, you selected these, you know, you came up with these uh, 31 texts because Sibel Dorum briefly touched upon this, uh, that, you know, you spent three months, but I'm sure it's, you know, uh, there's more than that. So could you expand on that a little bit? What was that decision-making process? Uh, like, uh, what, what were the main uh, motivations behind including uh, these texts? And, you know, I'm sure there are more. So uh, this is just one question. Uh, and then we can uh, receive uh, questions from our audience as well. Thank you. So let me start and Sibel will compliment me. Uh, first of all, as I said in, the, in my presentation, uh, this 
did not happen all of a sudden. I have been thinking about this for 40 years and I have been collecting uh, randomly, not systematically, uh, texts from our side which responded to Orientalism. So some of them were very obvious. I mean, Ernest Renan, a response to Ernest Renan uh, is a very well-known text, although it's a very difficult text even for Turks to read and understand in Turkish. And of course, there's no translation in into English ever since. It's an old uh, uh, text, obviously. Uh, so some of them uh, were already there, but with uh, Sibel, we did something else. And at this point, we really must thank Milli Kütüphane in Ankara for digitizing all the periodicals and for enabling us to do keyword search. So we would do, we would put in keywords like Sharkiyatçılık, and see what comes up with. And some of the uh, more obscure articles that we found uh, were results of that search. And we would put, uh, rem remind me, Sibel, but we would say Tevfik Fikret, for example, or we would put in um, Paris. What Pierre Lotti. Pierre, <laughs> obviously, Pierre Lotti. And all of these gave us a pool. Not everything that we found was writ written on Orientalism, and we did a lot of, you know, not, uh, other reading, but uh, it allowed us, Milli Kütüphane and Atatürk Kütüphane, but more Milli Kütüphane really, allowed us to do uh, our selection. Some we knew, I mean, who doesn't know Nazem Hikmet's poem on Pierre Lott? Uh, but we have we had to retranslate it, even though it had been translated into English because there were some errors in the translation. Anyway, you know, this is the basic process. Sibad, do you want to add anything to this? Uh, I mean, that was basically our method, as uh, Professor Celik has described. We were also doing a lot of brainstorming during the process. While we were talking about the texts that we already picked, we were also, you know, discussing that maybe other people touched on this so we were picking up other keywords uh, and you know looking up the already written articles of other academics work uh, so that that was basically our process a lot of brainstorming and a lot of research basically um, yes secondary literature was very useful mm -hmm. uh, some of it was extremely good and led us to good references. Uh, some of it frustrated us very much because there were no footnotes mm -hmm. <laughs> and no bibliography. So that really made us upset. Mm -hmm. um, we also asked outside help, for example, in Jannam, in the Erginun. Uh, we, uh, we sent her a bibliography and she basically said, okay, you're good, go. Uh, so we got outside help. Uh, and of course, there must be many, many, many things that we missed. In fact, um, a lawyer colleague of mine uh, reminded me that there is a similar situation in the literature in law. And uh, Aisha and you, were mentioning to me that it was brought to your attention that in economic theory there is a similar trend and hopefully they will all come together. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, somebody is asking us to repeat the name of the book by Namu Kemal. As a shrewd teacher, I want to tell you, go and get the book. Europe knows nothing about the Orient, and you'll see the full reference to Namu Kemal, but I'm not going to be shrewd here. And I'm going to tell you the title of the book. It's called Ronan Yudafana Mesu. Um, 
there really are so many questions regarding the uh, translation and they may be a little bit um, difficult to pick up, but careful readers of the book will realize that uh, we struggled a lot with terms like Alaturka, Frank, Jariye, what to do with these terms without falling into the Orientalist trap. And maybe Aaron can answer this question. Unmute yourself first. Sure. Um, the, the, um, the, uh, as, you, as you may know, um, the, the, the reception of uh, cultures in the so-called Orient also um, engendered all sorts of um, terminology with it. It wasn't simply transliteration of words, but also meanings attributed to those words. You know, odaluk is not, or odalisk, as it was made into odalisk, making it even more um, uh, um, exotic than it is, odaluk, um, is not simply a reference to what it could connotes, but it also was part of an entire cultural um, assumption about, about the uh, sort of sexual appetites of Oriental men. And one similar term that really was troubling, and particularly because in the text, it played such an important role, uh, but by Fatma Aliye is the term jariye. Now, uh, jariye is often understood as slave. And in fact, in this particular text, the Europeans that are inquiring about the jariye in the household refer to these girls as slaves. Um, now, it was very important to keep the Turkish speakers in the text repeatedly referring to the same girls as Jariye, so that we made it clear in the translation that there are two <coughs> understandings of the same social institution. And indeed, um, Fatma Aliye takes pains to differentiate between the institution of Jariye and the institution of slavery, which of course was also in practice. Um, and in order to sort of introduce, if you will, to the um, discourse, that difference, that is how that institution was perceived internally and how it was perceived externally or from the exterior. We thought we should keep the term jari uh, in the text. And so, you know, there were these small moments, but these are also moments of uh, a certain political statement we were trying to make because um, we still, have a lot of work ahead of us to um, disempower, if you will, this very, very strong dictionary, this very strong lexicon that was formed during Orientalism um, that, that not only described us, but also pigeonholed us into, uh, you know, a certain sort of cultural and civilizational backwater, if you will. Sorry, um, I see a question uh, about the cover visual. Uh, they are asking if we could 
talk about the significance of that photo, the cover photo. Who would like to do that? Rana should do it. Yes. I mean, we yes. are uh, giving a small story on the cover, but there is a, I think, little detail that will be interesting to talk about. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I wrote the uh, story on the uh, cover as well, but uh, I can say that uh, it's a very special photo for me. Uh, in my childhood, uh, I always saw it uh, on the floor of uh, my uh, grandparents' house. And uh, it was one and only, and I was small and it was uh, uh, up high. <laughs> and uh, now, uh, as I see it on the cover of, a, of this book, <laughs> it feels so strange. Uh, I mean, it's duplicated, <laughs> uh, but again, uh, still it's uh, special for me. Yeah, the uh, child uh, is my uh, mother's father and uh, he is two years old here. And uh, yes, that pose, uh, uh, his, his father uh, took this photo, but uh, and uh, we heard that uh, after this photo was taken, uh, my uh, granddad and uh, his mother uh, left uh, Macedonia and uh, came uh, to Anatolia, and uh, they left uh, uh, my granddad's dad there and uh, they never uh, saw each other uh, since then. Uh, yeah, and uh, I heard this story from my uh, grandfather. Uh, yeah, that's the short story, so short version of this photo. And when it comes yeah. to how we chose it, it really was obvious once Rana broke this photograph to mm -hmm. our little study in the Koch um, Anamed uh, uh, office. Mm -hmm. uh, we mm -hmm. had a lot of, as you know, uh, those of you who've seen the book, there are lots of images in the book and they're all very good. And we were debating which one to choose, then this became the obvious choice for us. Mm, yeah. It, as... it summarizes the uh, tragedy of the period very well. Uh, as well as uh, looking directly at the photograph that, you know, the whole uh, discourse on photography and modernity in the empire, I think enters into mm -hmm. uh, our choice here. And we just thought they were just so beautiful. And the decor, of course, the studio, the Western style decor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, uh, the Western style uh, in the Orient, <laughs> yeah. Yes, and the little boy is dressed in a girl's dress. So that's also... Yeah, with long hair. Mm -hmm. With long hair. And a lot of people think he's a girl. Yeah. yeah. So one more question maybe uh, that uh, there's this other question that, you know, how much annotation um, has been done to the original texts? Maybe uh, if you'd like to address this, uh, Sibel Doro. Unmute yourself, Sibel. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I, I wouldn't say a lot, actually. Uh, I mean, would, would you agree? I, I wouldn't say we, we did a lot of annotation. What did we do? Let's think about that because I think we were very careful. 
we gave in brackets uh, the mm -hmm. full names of some of the European uh, references. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, we did explain the Couton fountain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, or uh, sometimes the authors themselves gave the references. For example, uh, Ismail Hakkı Balpid, Ismail Hakkı gave references to Viole Leduc and he put it and we made it clear that it was his reference. Oh, when uh, the really major annotation we did was to figure nine, figure nine oh, yes. to uh, the, house uh, drawing. The Turkish house figure. The out. Turkish house. It was only called house. But yeah. we wrote, basically that was a major annotation and it isn't in the English. It's only in the English language. When we do the second edition of the Turkish version, we're going to put it there as well. And I think that's really, as, as um, Aron emphasized, that it's a very important intervention we did there, uh, not just with the terms, but also with hopefully helping our readers to uh, decipher a visual document. Mm -hmm. It's not just a pretty house with a crane on the roof. It's got a lot more going on there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, other than that, yes, we, in the English version, we knew that the film that I mentioned with Gary Cooper was an American film. So we put that in, so little things like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. We tried to especially include the original, you know, details of the original text, where they appeared in, etc. As I mentioned in my talk, we uh, added two sections, especially to the English edition, uh, for the biographies and the historical periodicals. Uh, so, other than that, I think, yeah, I think we kept it to the minimum as minimum as possible to you know not distract the reader with too many notes because these are literary texts so we didn't want to interrupt too much uh, but we at, in the instances like uh, Zeynep Çelik mentioned uh, like we found little details like the movie and uh, and other instances we tried to add some notes but other than that we try to keep it to the minimum I think. Okay, I just want to say um, um, one sentence to conclude this maybe. And this is that it is our great hope that our audience understands how much scholarship and very careful thought goes into the translation process. Uh, it's not automatic, it's not uh, mechanical, it's just such an intellectual labor uh, that often when we read a translated book, we don't even think that it is translated. However, I'm hoping that hearing the different voices uh, echo in the different texts here will help our readers in English to uh, get the nuances that the Turkish readers already have access to. I'm very thankful again uh, for being part of this process. And I wanted to sort of say one more thing about, about what you just said, uh, Professor Celik, because, you know, Orientalism was also an, a, a project that ultimately denied the voices of the people it aimed to describe. So bringing, uh, bringing these voices, not only in the, in the instance of this one volume that uh, we are, we've been talking about, but um, throughout, you know, anti-orientalist and, you know, anti-colonialist discourses to bring voices into these discourses that are authentic, that are contrarian, that are in fact native, if you will, 
um, indigenous to the cultures that have been, uh, again, pigeonholed, has to be part of the project of scholarship, has to be a part of the project of bridging these two, bridging uh, discourses, the dominant discourses of the West and the discourses that, that have been uh, disempowered in the process of Orientalism. So that's, that, that's, I hope, something that comes across as you are reading, that in fact, these are as close, you know, we're hearing voices that <clears throat> had not been welcome <clears throat> in the articulation stage of Orientalism. They were simply objectified. Now they are more subjects of their own writing. Um, any other um, concluding remarks uh, or? Uh, I, I would like to thank uh, Colombia Global Center <laughs> for uh, hosting us. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> no, thank you very much, uh, because this really, I think, gave us, like as Professor Celik mentioned, how much intellectual uh, labor went into the making of, of this book. And maybe uh, we can also uh, remind our audience that uh, the, the, we had a previous uh, talk with Anamet and uh, the recording, the link uh, of that lecture is also available online. Uh, it was in Turkish, but if you would like to have uh, more information about the book, uh, the, the link is available as well. And uh, we would like to thank you very much uh, uh, for, for this um, discussion. Thank you. And our audience, thank you very much. Thank you.